important is uh, creating, uh, building and maintaining robust social support networks that when we're distressed, reaching out to others, being with other people who uh, can provide us with unlimited uh, uh, nurturing and support is really critical. So we talk in the book about how to uh, build those networks, to identify them, to remember them, uh, et cetera. But from a climate perspective, most of the mental health programs around the country focus on presencing uh, skills, although they might call it something different. That's what treatment's about. It's about helping people sort of um, de- uh, regulate their nervous system. Uh, and that's helpful in the near term, but it's not sufficient to deal with climate change because uh, temperatures are going to rise, as I said, by around 2 degrees Celsius, maybe a lot more. Uh, and it's going to this problem, the, the, the disasters, the weather disasters, uh, floods, fires, et cetera, as well as the chronic stresses associated with climate change um, uh, are going to go on for uh, a couple of centuries. It's not a one-time event followed by a long period of calm. Uh, And so we also realize that we need to focus on what we call purposing skills, which really means helping people of all kinds, adults and youth, uh, find uh, meaning, direction, and hope in the middle of ongoing adversity. And that's what the second part of the book is about, uh, different kinds of purposing skills that we, that are evidence-based skills and tools and programs uh, that help people learn how to use adversity to learn, grow, uh, and increase their well-being. And then the last part of the book is applications to organizations and to communities um, that are using this model uh, uh, in various forms, some they'll call presencing and purposing, but... um, uh, as I said, but, uh, that, that the, these are skills that we've descri- I've described in the book with the help of the team that are used uh, around the world uh, and, and been successful. So um, both presencing and purposing are really c- critical, and ap- applying them to uh, at the co- organization and the community level and the educational systems is really important, and the focus. Uh, of the book and the focus of the ITRC, the organization I coordinate, is on prevention. And we really have to clarify that or be clear about that. We are not going to be able to continue to respond to every emergency uh, and think that that's the solution. Uh, It'll be vital to improve our emergency response or mental health um, disaster response systems, but they are very uh, weak already and fragile. And just as we found with Superstorm Sandy, but a bunch of other disasters we've had, they are often easily overwhelmed. Um, and uh, so that's really not, uh, we, we can't put our, uh, all of our eggs in that basket, so to speak. We have to focus on prevention. Uh, and this means that the, what we're trying to do, what the, what the ITRC is trying to do, is really encourage uh, communities across the country and actually internationally launch preventative programs with, that are that help individuals and groups build their personal and psychosocial spiritual resilience. And I'll say just a couple more words, and then I'll be, uh, uh, just open it up for questions. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that. One is we're, we've asked we ask people to organize in their community or in their neighborhood or even in their organization um, resilience leadership councils, senior leaders who come together in the community to to assess the current level of personal, psychosocial, spiritual resilience, determine what kind of programs are offered and educational opportunities are offered to build resilience, um, personal resilience, um, and, and uh, group resilience, and, and, and also and then support those efforts or, or uh, begin to add new ones and support new ones, fund new ones, but also to come together to uh, jointly promote social narratives focused on safe healthy and equitable behaviors and activities um, and uh, to really counter what in our country uh, is a tremendous amount of social narratives that dominate neighborhoods and communities that promote quite the opposite. Um, So, uh, and then we want to launch educational programs uh, from K through 12 all the way up through college and even professional development programs focused on these issues. We really think that launching a personal and psychosocial, spiritual, or short form, a human 
resilience building movement across the country is critical to address climate change. And one of the benefits of this, by the way, is that when people are able to regulate their nervous system and then uh, apply new skills to find meaning, direction, and hope in adversity, which in psychology is called post-traumatic growth skills, they almost always end up further interested, more motivated to help other people or help the natural environment in some way. Uh, it's called eudonomic well-being that uh, people begin to transcend their own uh, personal interest to engage in other things when they have these kinds of skills. So that's what the book's about, and that's the kind of work I've been doing. Uh, in fact, next Monday we're running a uh, two-hour workshop for the American Public Health Association in Washington, D.C. that will be live cast around the country uh, if you're interested in uh, learning some of those skills and hearing more about this. But I'll stop there and open it up to questions. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Tracy Urbic, a member of the Online Education Committee. And I wonder if you might be willing to um, first share the URL or let people know how they might be able to get in on that live cast, or we can follow up with that after the webinar if that works for you. But I have a handful of questions that I wanted to start us off with, if that's okay. That sounds good. And I, I can send you uh, the, the how to get it. You have to basically contact the North Public Health okay. Association. But. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll, we'll get that information from you and then pass it on to the uh, webinar attendees. So one of the questions, I know that you do a number of workshops and training sessions on, on this topic. Is there anything that you can think of in particular about some strategies that you think that create for libraries to implement for the presenting skills and your um, the human resilience movement? Yeah, very good question. And, and, you know, first of all, libraries are just critical. Um, in today's day and age, uh, uh, finding places or having places that are uh, offer information uh, that, you know, has been done and written in the past, books uh, and other kinds of information that's done in the past, and we, we're, uh, where we can actually go and find knowledge is critical. Just one example, I took a week and a half off uh, three weeks ago, my wife and I, we went to Utah. Uh, we thought we were going to get into the warmth and sun of, of Utah, uh, and it turns out we had a snowstorm. So <laughs> we were hiking in snow and sleeping in 26-degree uh, temperature, but we couldn't find a newspaper anywhere in any town uh, in southwest, southeast Utah. They just don't make them anymore. And so we thought, well, where do people get information? Well, they get it from these, you know, the, the TV or the mostly on the web and uh, watching certain things. But the libraries are critical to sort of have a place where people can go to get good information. But so um, I think just having uh, information about uh, human resilience, so to speak, and presencing and purposing would be great. I think running some train-the-trainer programs uh, which is what we mostly do now, uh, where uh, your where, where different library staff learn presencing and purposing skills, and then learn how to teach it to others, can help your own staff in terms of your the internal dynamics that happen within libraries. And what we know is that uh, in many organizations, not just because of climate change, but it's growing because of climate change. Organizations and groups become what we call trauma organized uh, in order to defend themselves against perceived threats, stresses, uh, uh, lack of funding, and overwork by staff, and, uh, other sorts of things. People and groups uh, adopt uh, informal and formal, sometimes formal mechanisms intended to protect themselves in their mind from the threat. But what happens instead is they end up further traumatizing and stressing employees, uh, clients, stakeholders, etc. So you'll find benefits by learning these skills that will help your organizations. And you could become, the libraries could become a center point to come and learn these skills in a neutral environment. You could offer training workshops or, off, or ask trainers to come and offer training workshops there if you have those facilities. So I think it's a, it's a really important uh, resource, uh, the, the library systems. And just one example, we run a program here in Lane County, I live in Lane County, or Eugene, Oregon. Uh, uh, 
of the building of Rosea Lane County. We've offered monthly workshops on these skills for almost two years, and they're all at the downtown Eugene Library in a room they have, and they give it for free, so it's open to the public. I think it's a great resource. That's great. Yeah, in the library world, we do a lot about information literacy, so trying to help people where they get their sources and, and those types of things. Um, another question that we have for you is you talked in your, uh, this was from one of our participants, you mentioned that there's different concerns for different demographics and how they cope. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that concern, uh, about being able to even start to think about these concerns comes from a place of privilege and how those of us who have this privilege can help others who don't? Yeah, good question. First of all, what, what I meant is that uh, many of the uh, presencing skills, as an example, can be taught to children, the same ones that you teach to adults, but you have to teach them in a very different way. Um, and uh, a good one, for example, is resourcing. Uh, just as an example, um, uh, if, if all of you on the line would just bring to mind right now one or two images of uh, something that brings you calm or peace or joy, um, and just sort of think about that and, and really sort of go, go into the details about it. Just one example, I had a cat, a kitty cat named Beluga, 17-pound a uh, kitty cat, and just the image of holding Beluga in my arms brings me calm and peace. So that's an image, uh, uh, an example of a uh, presencing skill, uh, resourcing, um, um, and w and then we do resource intensification about that. If somebody asks you for questions, well, how long? For example, when did you have the cat? What did it look like, etc. So help someone go deeper into those feelings, and what you're doing is your by doing that, you're in, in the people who are thinking about it are uh, triggering their parasympathetic nervous system, which is the brake system of the body, because what keeps us uh, uh, dysregulated is the sympathetic nervous system, which you could call the body's accelerator. Well, you can do the same kind of a skill with children, but you do that, for example, by having them draw pictures of something that they're... Um, that brings them joy, uh, and other kinds of skills. So learning age-appropriate ways to teach the skills is really important, and demographically appropriate skills. So, for example, what we have found in our work, and we've worked all over the country, is that people of color often do not respond well to meditation and breath-based skills. There's some religious reasons for that and other sorts of things, but they do often respond better to based skills, such as uh, the tracking I was talking about, watching your physical sensations, or resourcing, or it might be with a different group, uh, music, when dance, as a way to uh, trigger the parasympathetic nervous system, if you will. So understanding those, knowing the populations, the groups you're working with, their age, their demographic backgrounds, is really important, and then you can tailor the skills to, to, to the groups that make sense. And, and most of the time, you can just ask them. Would, would, this, would, would you like to try this? What, what about this one instead? And just get the sense from the people you're working with what, what resonates. Really interesting. I, I love all the science-based, um, you know, kind of touching down. There was a question about, before the webinar, about empirical evidence for how people respond, and I think that this is a very interesting and explanatory for that. Um, what I'll point out is for people that in the chat, transcript, there's the link to the, uh, the training that Bob's doing on Monday. We have about two minutes, and um, we need to save one minute for announcements at the end. So, Bob, I wonder if you might have just maybe a very short statement about advice for community sustainability leaders, something to help kind of prevent burnout and despair, something maybe quick you can press on, and then we'll turn it over to Madeline for the last minute of our webinar. Great, thanks. Well, I think maybe the most important thing to realize, is, again, because I did so much of my work for, for 25 years in the field, that focusing uh, exclusively on the external factors around sustainability, just like we did in the climate field, uh, is important. Obviously, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to help the uh, physical systems uh, harden them for the impacts of climate change. But the most important thing people can do is help individuals and groups um, begin to 
learn these kinds of skills because, again, if we don't, they will react in ways that uh, undermine or completely block our ability to do the physical things needing, needed to address the environment and sustainability. Uh, and just as importantly, um, we have a much greater chance of engaging people in uh, activities to, that can help increase their well-being and the well-being of others and the natural environment when people, individuals and groups, learn these skills. So just want to encourage everyone in the sustainability field to expand uh, what they're doing to add a major or equal focus on building personal and psychosocial spiritual resilience, not just the physical, uh, uh, external physical world, which still activities, which is important, but it's not, it obviously has not gotten as far enough yet and probably won't in the long run, but unless we do this. Well, thank you so much, Bob. This is really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Madeline. And again, Bob, thank you so much. I really, I haven't read your book yet, but I'm really looking forward to reading it now. I feel like I have a better basis to go into it. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bob, thank you so much. We're going to move on to the next things happening with Sustain RT. We have a virtual membership meeting on Wednesday, June 14th from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, you can just go to Sustain RT's webpage and get on to the uh, link that way. And then if you're coming to annual in Chicago for the two days of Saturday and Sunday, first we're kicking off with Bill McKibben. We're so excited that he's coming and this is a shared co-sponsored event with this, this um, Social Responsibilities Roundtable, the American Indian Library Association, and the Asian South Pacific Library Association. We're having a social event, and on Sunday we have two building-related um, events, and then our general membership meeting. As always, everyone is welcome to attend, whether you're a Sustain RT member or not, for all of our events. So thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm going to sign off unless anyone has another word or two that I've missed. And we can stay on the chat for a little while if people want to continue. And that one, David just asked about um, any events available virtually for those who won't be at the conference itself. We're not up to that yet, um, except for the virtual membership meetings, which we hold twice a year right before the in-person meetings, but look, we are still working on how to connect people in virtually to the other activities besides our webinars, which of course are interactive, but it's a good question. We're getting there. And then um, the question had also been asked about seeing if Bob will answer some of our questions via email, and we'll certainly ask him if he can do that, and if we get the responses, we will forward them on. Yeah, let's try for that. He's very amenable, and we're so glad that we got to hear from him today. So thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm going to stay on the chat. I have a couple more things I was going to share if others want to join that way for as we sort of taper off. 